يسرني أن أرحب بكم جميعا في هذه الجلسة وهي جلستنا الأخيرة لهذا اليوم التي سنتحدث فيها عن التأثير الاقتصادي لجائحة كورونا هذه الجائحة التي تسببت في أسوأ أزمة اقتصادية منذ الكساد العظيم في ثلاثينيات القرن الماضي مصدرها كان القطاع الصحي بلغ عدد الإصابات حتى الآن 260 مليون إصابة وعدد الوفيات ما يفوق الخمسة مليون ومئتين ألف ونحن نتحدث الآن هناك ضيف جديد متحور جديد ضيف ثقيل لا نعلم ما مدى يعني سيكون ما مدى تأثيره وكيف ستكون نهايته ولكن الأثر الاقتصادي كان هناك انكماش حاد في الناتج المحلي الإجمالي العالمي ارتفاع في معدلات البطالة ذلك بسبب الإغلاق والشلل الذي أحدثه هذا هذه الأزمة على جانبي العرض والطلب هناك القطاع الصحي وهناك القطاع المتأثرة الإمداد اللوجستي الخدمات غير ذلك أيضا هناك أنشطة الاقتصادية كالتسوق السياحة إذا هذا أضعف جانب العرض عياقة في الإنتاج وفي الإمداد إذا هذا أدى إلى ضعف في العرض وفي الطلب في آن واحد ثم هناك أيضا عامل الثقة وعامل اليقين وكما تعلمون هو مهم في الاقتصاد ومهم للتوقعات المستقبلية هذه الأزمة تختلف عن الأزمتين السابقتين عن أزمة الكساد العظيم في ثلاثينات القرن الماضي وعن الأزمة المالية في عام 2008 حيث أن مصدر الأزمتين السابقتين كان هو في الدول المتقدمة وكانت في جانب الطلب في القطاع المالي على وجه الخصوص إنما في هذه الحالة هذه الأزمة مصدرها في فيروس ضرب الدول المتقدمة والدول النامية في آن واحد والعرض والطلب معا وضرب أسس الاقتصاد العالمي بدون مقدمات ف الذي حدث أنه نحن نعيش في اقتصادات حروب أو كوارث طبيعية حيث يتم تدمير القوة العاملة في هذه الحالة هناك تدمير مؤقت للقوة العاملة هناك أكثر من ثلث سكان العالم وضعوا تحت الحجر الصحي في آن واحد ومن المتوقع أن تصل عدد الوظائف المفقودة في عام 22 إلى 200 مليون وأن يزاح ما يقارب ال 115 مليون إلى حد الفقر المدقع كيف يعمل هذا على جانبي العرض والطلب في البداية كانت صدمة سلبية على جانب العرض بسبب الوفيات وبسبب الحجر الصحي هذه أدت إلى إعاقة الإنتاج وسلاسل الإمداد بالتالي هذه صدمة على جانب العرض انتقلت إلى جانب الطلب من خلال عامل الثقة زعزعة الثقة واليقين وبالتالي هذا أدى إلى إحجام المستهلكين أو إحجام الإحجام عن الاستهلاك والإحجام عن الاستثمار إذا هذه صدمة على جانب الطلب انتقلت إلى جانب العرض مرة أخرى وذلك من خلال انخفاض الدخل على المنتجين وانخفاض الدفقات النقدية وبالتالي ارتفعت معدلات البطالة ومعدلات الإقالة والبطالة والإفلاس والتعثر في سداد الديون من هنا انتقلت مرة أخرى إلى جانب الطلب وذلك بارتفاع معدلات الإفلاسات والبطالة و... There are so many companies that have gone into bankruptcy and the high levels of unemployment. So, so many countries have rationalized their spending, have, have reduced their spending. So this was a kind of a series of effects that have impacted the, the economy as a whole. 
So economies have retracted, and this is to stay with us for some time. So that is why there have been a number of measures that have been undertaken in order to intervene and to stop this impact so as not to aggravate and become long-term. So there have to be an intervention, there have to be in support uh, in order to prop up the different sectors, economic, social, medical sectors, uh, in order to reinforce safety and economic stability, social stability in particular. The service sector, the basic goods, uh, and in order to support other sectors such as SMEs uh, and so on. So the impact was also at the level of the GDP, and the countries have resorted to supporting the different sectors. So Japan supported the, its economy. The same applies to the United States of America. Also, there have been a great deal of support that was given by the government to the different sectors. Also, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, many, many countries, uh, they tried to present support to different sectors. So the GCC countries suffered a great deal due to the decline of the prices of oil in addition to the repercussions of the pandemic. And also we have seen direct impact as a result of the lockdown. So also we have seen a large percentage of deficit. And with us here today, we have one of the prominent professors in the field. We have Guy Peters from the University of Pittsburgh, from the United States of America, and he is the editor-in-chief of the Review Public Policy, and he has authored many books, uh, studies, articles, uh, published uh, in a number of peer-reviewed uh, periodicals and magazines. The floor is yours, sir. Go ahead, sir. Good afternoon. Pleasure to be there. I, w I wish I could be there in person, but of course that's impossible at the moment. Uh, so let me share my screen and proceed to talk a bit about some of the things that we, we all are concerned about in, in, with the pandemic. So, okay, so the title here is Governing in Crises plural, the Gulf states in the era of the COVID-19. Oops, let me go back up. Okay. So I was given, this was an interesting challenge that was given me to talk about today. And I thank you for the opportunity. So it's based on some general ideas about how, how governance has proceeded during the pandemic, not just in the Gulf, not just in the GCC countries, but across the world. I'm not an expert in the GCC region, so some of the things I say may be, uh, appear somewhat uh, banal, but I'll try to uh, relate it as far as I can to, to, the, to the region. Uh, now, you'll notice the title that I gave for the talk was, it was crisis in the plural. That is, as the introductory speaker said, I'm, uh, that we're talking about not just a single crisis, we're talking about multiple crises. 
So a lot of the, most of the discussion arguably about the pandemic has been on the health issues. But those health issues have been drivers for a number of other issues that have to be confronted simultaneously. And, and also over the last several years, we've had to deal with several interconnected crises. Health, which is again, the most obvious. Economics, which was described already. Social life, vast changes in the way in which we deal with one another socially. And then finally, politics and government. So this has not been a single crisis, this has been multiple crises occurring simultaneously. So, but these are all fundamentally a problem of governance. So the basic idea of governance is steering and control. The idea of steering the economy and the society towards some collective goals. And in this case, some of the goals were relatively clear. Or most of the goals, in fact, were relatively clear. We all wanted to survive the pandemic. We wanted the economy to thrive. We wanted to maintain our social lives. But those were all very difficult goals to attain. And particularly when the crises were interconnected. Because to some extent, when we dealt with one crisis, i.e. health, by lockdowns and quarantines, we exacerbated the crisis in other domains, such as the economy. So when we deal with one issue, we, we tended then to, to exacerbate the problems in the other. <clears throat> and so the Gulf states, in some ways, haven't been that different from the rest of the world. Uh, health issues with the driver, they faced you face economic slowdowns and shutdowns, quarantines, lockdowns, etc., and disruptions of many aspects of social life, such as education, and also some pressures to change public policies, perhaps especially labor market policy, and, and also dealing with the public deficit. As again, it was pointed out previously, uh, the, the, the pandemic and the economic crisis has produced massive de public deficits in many countries. So how do we deal with those as a part of the economic policy? But also the GCC countries has some very special challenges. Um, first of all, and perhaps most prominently, large number of migrant workers. And large migrant workers who lived in relatively close conditions and therefore facilitated the spread of the disease. Secondly, the two major airline hubs in the world are in the GCC countries. And, and thirdly, an economy based primarily on fossil fuels, at least historically, and then with the declining demand for oil and gas uh, and during the pandemic, major hits to the economies. And then again, the, the problem then of perhaps two distinct societies, one for citizens, one and citizens and one for residents, i.e. the migrant workers, both in, in construction industries, et cetera, and also in now also in high tech industries. So again, the migrant worker issue, we're people working in large numbers uh, relative to the number of citizens, many of whom are laborers, but also high tech employees and particularly the laborers working in close quarters, easing the spread of, of the vaccine, and how to manage these large number of individuals in, in a health crisis when work becomes impossible or extremely risky. Uh, how do you, do, you, do, can you, do you deport people? Do you provide social support? How do you deal with health services? So a particular challenge given this large number of non-citizens within the countries. The airline hubs, two of the busiest in the world, and particularly based on the hub and spoke model, being that large number of passengers, <clears throat> excuse me, moving through the hubs, shifting planes. So again, facilitating the transmission of disease. So millions of people going through these hubs during normal times, coming in contact with one another, easing the spread of disease but also the airline hubs, which had to be shut down, were major contributors to the economy, along with the oil and gas industries. The fossil fuels I've already mentioned, so there's been some diversification, but it's slow, major drop in demand for fossil fuels, 
with meaning then significant decline in revenues, public and private. And at the same time, with the public sector, increased demands for spending on health care, for social support, and on enforcement. So essentially then a, 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 double, a double effect, the declining revenues, increasing expenditures, hence reducing the deficit crises or deficit problems in several countries. But also, but the, but the problems then that the Gulf states have, have faced are not dissimilar in many ways to those faced by other countries. Uh, and I, let me go through these quickly. Then the decline in health, public health capacity, an initial confusion and delay, and, and problems of compliance. So one of the most important, I think, that it was really highlighted in almost every country in the, as the pandemic hit was it what's happened with medicine and with public health. So in almost every country, there's been a decline in traditional public health. And certainly in the US spending, you know, in my own country, spending for conventional public health measures has dropped 15 to 20% over the last decade. So we're spending a lot more on medicine, curative medicine, high tech medicine, but we're not spending as nearly as much money on the old methods of tracking diseases, dealing with uh, vaccinations, dealing with immunizations of all, all types. So traditional public health has really become unfashionable, whereas curative high tech medicine became more fashionable. <clears throat> and some of those old methods became very important during the pandemic, particularly uh, contact tracing. So a method that was developed originally for tracking tuberculosis. So who have people who've had the disease been in contact with? And you trace them, then you trace their contacts. So you use workers on the ground, you use people to interview those who are ill, follow their, their trace, their contacts, then try to trace all the instances of the disease. It's not as easy as it may seem, it requires certain skills. And those skills have been eroded. So when we faced the, when the pandemic arose, we didn't have that type of basis in public health in, in most countries to deal with even these old fashioned but extremely valuable methods of public health. And almost all countries faced an initial period of confusion and delay. So was this just another case of seasonal flu? Was it really the same as SARS? So SARS was more deadly, but it didn't spread as rapidly. Or MERS, same way with MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. So, you know, what was this disease really like? So it's hard to treat the disease or deal with the disease until we understand what it really is. How strongly do we need to react? in order to, to deal with the, with the problem. And initially, most countries probably responded too weakly, did not understand just how severe this pandemic was going to be for fear of overreacting. So several recent epidemics like swine flu, or presumed, I should say presumed epidemics like swine flu never materialized. And governments looked uh, rather silly having engaged in huge efforts to try to deal with diseases that really didn't exist or didn't exist in nearly the extent that they were assumed. So a certain amount of back and forth and lack of understanding and delay. And for this pandemic, as with any other major epidemic, delay is a major problem because more and more cases then have more and more contacts. And then finally, problems of compliance. Um, so once governments decided they were going to make major interventions in order to deal with the pandemic, um, would, would the public comply? How willing would the people be to, under, to undergo the rather severe deprivations that were involved with quarantines, lockdowns, losing their jobs? And that answer varied. Uh, a lot. I mean, as you've doubtless seen in the media, 
the United States and Britain and to some, and some extent uh, other Anglo-American countries have been very resistant to those types of, of measures and continue to be, whereas other countries have been much more compliant, willing to accept depri those deprivations, are willing to accept health over wealth, uh, at least in the short term. And we now see in, in Europe now, as a, as a fourth wave begins, that uh, this has gone on very long and compliance is weakening. So how do we gain compliance from the public? You know, do the public trust their governments? Do they trust the experts? And if they don't, how do we build trust or rebuild trust? Now, the Gulf states were fortunate in some sense of having strong, being strong states and with a habit of compliance by the public. So having the capacity to deal with these issues and to gain public compliance more readily than many other states, having mechanisms of identifying and controlling the, the migrants, even though there are a large number of people, still being able at least to identify and know where the, where the individuals are. There's still then major needs to monitor and, and enforce and, there, and thereby to gain compliance, willing or unwilling, to the, to the measures needed to deal with the pandemic. So let me talk then briefly with the outcomes about the outcomes in particularly in the Gulf states and in comparative terms, in terms of health, economics, and government. And to talk about the health outcomes of several types, the number of cases, the number of deaths, vaccination rates. Now, if you've seen the paper that I wrote for the, for the, for the conference, these are reported in more detail there. So this is going to be a relatively quick summary of the data, not a huge amount of data even then, but a relatively quick summary of the data that's presented in, in, those, in the paper. Uh, when you look at the number of cases and the number of deaths, there seem to be two distinct groups within the, within the GCC countries. One group composed of Bahrain, Kuwait and Oman with relatively high rates of both cases and deaths per capita. The other group, Qatar, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates having relatively low rates of deaths and cases. Now to some extent, these results uh, appear somewhat counterintuitive. That is, if you look here, the two of the, th of the three states with the best outcomes are those with the large airline hubs, the large where one might have expected there to be more cases, to be to been higher levels of spread, but there weren't. But the other account, the other interesting factor here was that even the best of the of the of the Gulf states were not as good as some other countries in the MENA, MENA region. Uh, as though better than many in, in Europe and North America. So there's some really interesting comparative governance questions that arise here. Why were the, did this variation occur among these six countries? These six countries, I mean, oh, they vary in size, they vary in other ways, but in some ways, when seen from afar, are relatively similar. They're all essentially uh, monarchical forms of government, uh, uh, oil-based economies have a number of factors that are very similar, yet produced very different outcomes in terms of their uh, success or failures in dealing with, with the pandemic. And why are these states, which are generally very wealthy, did not, did not perform as well as some other of the states, even in the region? So in both cases, both within the region, with, excuse me, both within the GCC countries and across the Middle East and North African region, there were significant variations uh, and significant variations that appeared, again, somewhat counterintuitive. So how do we understand then uh, what happened here and how can we build on that understanding? 
you know, as I was writing the paper and getting ready for the conference, I did try to do my research, but I couldn't find any viable, you know, or at least uh, consistent reasons to explain these differences. So I hope those of you in the audience could give me the answer. And when we get to the question and answer period. Okay, then vaccination rates as another health outcome. Uh, by most, most rankings, the United Arab Emirates leads the world in terms of the level of vaccinations, uh, with almost uh, the entire population having you know, the last figures I saw, 99% of the population having gotten at least one shot, 90% having gotten two, and a significant amount of the population having gotten a, the third booster shot. So doing extremely well in terms of vaccinations. Qatar, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia are also very high. <clears throat> but again, differences. So how do we understand those differences? How do we understand uh, what factors in government, in, in the matter of which public health is managed, etc., explain how different countries have been more or less successful in vaccinating, even with, when having the wealth to be able to buy the vaccines on, on, in the world market, which many other countries, of course, have not been able to yet. The economic outcomes, again, we, we've talked about, I think, already several times, but a major loss of public revenue, major loss of business associated with that loss of public revenue. But the good news here may be that some, this is, provides some incentive to diversify the economies. So economies that have been extremely heavily dependent upon mineral wealth, fossil fuels, then facing a seeming green revolution around the world and the declining use of those fuels, this may be the way in which to, as Thomas Birkeland calls, maybe a focusing event, an event that concentrates the mind to think about, okay, how do we move from where we are to where we need to be for the future? So building then a, a more high-tech economy, building the, the means then to be continue to be wealthy and to be at, to be successful in a, in a world that with a declining demand for oil and gas. Uh, but another you know, part of the outcomes then seems also the economic outcomes seems to also to be in, increased inequalities between citizens and migrants with high tech jobs and then those and then the migrants with less uh, well paid jobs. So the inequalities that were already there appear to be exacerbated by the pandemic, even with social policy interventions. So you know, managing that level of inequality may, may be more difficult. You know, certainly, you know, the, the pandemic has tended to, sh to change people's ideas about work and, may, and, their, and their living in much of the world. And the GCC countries may not be any different. So the political and governmental outcomes. Um, one thing that seems to have happened, or actually happening, is some basic changes in the political economy. That is a reduction in the state economic involvement. So in terms of the employment of citizens, uh, the GCC countries have very high levels of public employment, extremely high levels. So uh, whether that's sustainable over the long run, particularly with, with the declining revenues, from fossil fuels, so a need then to shift to a more diverse economy, uh, diversified not only in terms of the products uh, and the sources of revenue, but also in the level and the role of the state in in governing the, the economy. Also, and already also some loosening of some aspects of the labor law, but arguably in general, one could argue that. The, that the governments have performed reasonably well, performed much better than many, including my own. Um, so this may re reinforce the, the state model that's worked 
reasonably well in these systems, which in the long term may facilitate the move the capacity to transform the economies. Uh, and and arguably then also with the with the general reducing reduction of pressures toward democratization around the world, the less pressure for fundamental political change. And so then the last thing we need to think about, I think in terms of, uh, of the result of the pandemic in terms of governance, or what lessons have we learned or what lessons should we have learned from the pandemic? And I'll talk about those in terms of preparedness coordination and interaction and resilience. Sorry. So first of all, preparedness. Crises don't happen until they do. So we, we go along thinking that you know, we don't, won't have a pandemic. Um, we, don't, we don't plan. We don't plan adequately for the pandemic. I mean, the, the Trump administration in the U.S. was an extreme example, but they were left a very detailed plan for dealing with pandemics uh, by, by, the, by, the, by, uh, by the Obama administration and threw, threw it out saying it wasn't necessary. Of course, that's, you know, that's some of the peculiarities of that administration. But the basic idea is not uncommon, that uh, we don't need to plan for, uh, for these major crises. And planning in general has gone out of fashion. We tend to be more reactive rather than proactive. So, but you know, our, our, hopefully we've learned from this pandemic that we need to think, be thinking about the next one and the one after that. So the governments need then to invest more in planning for that future. But prepare for what? Now, we couldn't have predicted what this pandemic would be. And there was respiratory, that the way in which it was spread, et cetera, et cetera. So we, planning for, the, for pandemics, planning for public health requires building in a lot of adaptive capacity as well, both in terms of scale and in terms of content. Coordination and interactions. So if nothing else, the pandemic has taught us that no health, no policy domain from government functions by itself. That health was the driver for the other changes in the in policies, but clearly po health policy, economic policy, social policy, education policy, pick your favorite policy domain, was to some extent impacted by the by the pandemic. So we need to think then about how to build then uh, better, better coordinated, better integrated policy domain or policy management within governments. So, and likewise, so then solutions have to be multifaceted and integrated, rather than domain by domain by domain. So, we need to think about government as a whole, in relatively holistic ways, rather than thinking about it as merely a set of segments. That's difficult to do. Individuals are trained to think about one policy area. If you're a, a doctor, you think about health. Uh, and likewise, if you're a doctor, you work in a health organization. So your organization is telling you to think about health. But we need then to think more broadly across about how do we manage all these interactions, not just in times of pandemics, but in general. And then finally, trying to build in resilience. Uh, the ability to, to adapt, but also the ability to adapt while maintaining some basic patterns of governance and basic patterns of social and economic life. So we need to figure out then what our major goals are. Where do we want to be? How do we want to live? And how do we adapt the existing systems to be able to provide that over the long run, whether faced with pandemics or not? So the pandemic has given us essentially good training to think about this. And hopefully then we've learned to do this. But I should have said lessons taught rather than lessons learned. Because I think many of the lessons that 
should have emerged or should be emerging from the pandemic aren't really being learned, not just in the Gulf states by any means. Being prepared for the future is always difficult. The, you know, the future isn't here yet. The future we don't see, especially when there's so many current demands, especially when there's so many things we should want to do right now, rather than thinking about 10 years, 20 years, or some unknown future. And it's particularly a problem for democratic governments, whose the, the voters of the future aren't voting today. The voters today want things today. So democratic governments in particular have problems dealing with these, with lessons learned and planning and preparing for some uncertain future. So in, in conclusion then, um, we've been facing major governance challenges. There are challenges in a whole a host of policy domains and there are challenges then that cut across the whole of government. And the challenges then that also then link that government to the society. Now they've been met, these challenges have been met reasonably successfully in the GCC countries, uh, less successfully perhaps in others. Um, but the major question that arises from all this, which I think, again, I would argue is the major thing we need to think about out of the pandemic as we are hopefully uh, coming to some sort of conclusion that may be wishful thinking, but as we're hopeful, com hopefully coming to some sort of conclusion, what happens next time? How do we get ready for some uncertain future then to be able to govern it, to manage it better than we did uh, with this pandemic? So I thank you for the opportunity and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. شكرا جزيلا لهذه ال... هذا العرض الشامل سأحاول أن ألخص بشكل سريع ما قاله البروفيسور So you talked about uh, a problem that is multifaceted, uh, economic, social, medical and if we have to and you want to, to solve one side, uh, this would have an impact on another side. That is why we need to have a comprehensive kind of methodology and we have to take into account uh, the different uh, perspectives uh, and also we have to uh, take into account the depletion of hydrocarbon sector and this is a problematic that we have to take into account uh, and also countries uh, that uh, face uh, a decline in the oil sector, uh, in the prices of oil. Uh, there is also an increase when it comes to the public sector. There are challenges that the service sector is facing, and this applies to all countries developed and developing. At the beginning, there was uh, lack of clarity and confusion. Uh, as to how to deal with the virus and also that we have to be prepared and uh, do we respond uh, proactively or do we respond uh, uh, on a reaction basis and that we have to be prepared for the next pandemic and perhaps that comes after. So there are so many points that the professor underlined uh, in his presentation and you talked also about a number of statistics. Uh, Kuwait, Bahrain and Oman, they have had a larger number of deaths compared to Qatar, Saudi Arabia and Emirates. And this is something that is a bit enigmatic, particularly that these two countries have large companies. So he also posed the question whether we have an answer to this question. So the policies perhaps differ from one country to another, how people are committed to uh, the quarantine and lockdown uh, and so on. 
and he also talked about uh, differences in levels of vaccination between these two groups. And uh, we hope that the crisis is going to lead to more diversification. And also, he talks about uh, the impact on the economy and the uh, differences between economic levels between citizens. And this is uh, going to manifest worldwide and not only in a particular region. And also, he talks about migrant workers. He talks about a number of recommendations, uh, the intervention of the uh, state in the economy, and uh, talks about rentier states. So the impact on the communities uh, and uh, called for more liberalization when it comes to labor laws. He talks about the response of uh, governments uh, during the pandemic. So also there is a call for more democratization and also planning for crises, uh, uh, future crises and also investment and coordination and interaction com and uh, integration between the different uh, policies. Uh, so policies should not be just ad hoc uh, or in uh, silos. Uh, they should complement each other, so economic, social, uh, health policies and so on. So he talked about uh, lessons taught more than lessons learned uh, and also the importance of economic diversification. So these countries uh, have started the uh, economic diversification even before the pandemic and perhaps now it is time to go further in this regard. <laughs> and diversification should come by necessity and this is based uh, on uh, examples from East Asia and many countries in Asia. So crises should also lead to reforms. We hope that. And he also talked about uh, the importance of foreseeing the future and also good planning based uh, on uh, a good forecast of the future. I'd like to open the floor now for questions, if there are any questions. Go ahead, doctor. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Peters for his presentation. So my intervention is going to be in Arabic. GCC countries uh, are going into a phase where they have to change their uh, economic development and also to enlarge their technological development and also giving opportunities to the people of this area. And the problem lies in the policies and the policy response. So policies, whether these are financial policies or monetary policies or uh, labor policies, we in the GCC 
it is the financial policy that has the upper hand. So we have revenues from oil and gas, and we distribute those revenues on different expenditures. So the main challenge that we are facing in the region is the absence of an apparatus that would shine light in a comprehensive way on how these policies should be drafted amongst the problems that we have faced during the pandemic uh, is that uh, there, is, there are failures uh, in some social uh, aspects and in the fact that uh, there have been a number of financial policies that have been undertaken and that have harmed the economic diversification. So what is the formula that GCC countries should undertake in devising their policies? Should there bear an apparatus or a unity that a unit, sorry, that would uh, devise these public policies? So, uh, in order to uh, come up with policies for the coming phase. Yes, go ahead, Professor. Question. Oh, I'm unmuted. Okay. That's a very important question. And I think that's the, an the answer is up to every country to devise a me mechanism that works best in their own setting. Okay, that said, I, mean, I think you do need some sort of central policy apparatus uh, that then is providing policy advice uh, and providing it in a unbiased and informed manner to the government. Uh, and I think you, you were implying, which I think is, is quite right, that often economic policy and financial policy dominates, whereas, again, the, the, the needs for, for the public, the need for societies are much more broadly, broadly defined. So you need them to have some sort of forum of policymakers, or I should say advisors, very really more than perhaps policymakers, that provides a way then of looking and uh, looking across government. And to think about government really then as a matrix, that is, where you have conventional ministries in one direction and a set of uh, major policy problems like diversification, like labor policy that cut across those, those uh, conventional ministerial structures. Now that's difficult to pull off, but it's, it's really crucial if one's trying to produce well-ordered well and planned change. Thank you, Dr. Khalid, and uh, thank you, Professor Peter, for such an insightful presentation. My name is Ahmed Badran, and I'm an associate professor of public policy at uh, Qatar University Department of International Affairs. Uh, so uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, I think it fits very nicely what we describe in the policy field as wicked problems or wicked policy problems, which are problems with no final solutions but temporal uh, resolutions. So uh, two main features of those types of problems. The first one is they are very, very, uh, uh, there is a, a very high speed in the change uh, in their nature. And the second one uh, is the high level of uncertainty. And my question is, given your last standing experience in the field of public admin and public policy, how do you see uh, the policy and the decision makers in the GCC country should model through those uncertainties? I know that you have touched upon some areas in your presentation, talking about coordination, talking about cooperation, and talking about building trust. But given that these are challenging issues, even under the normal situations for any governance system, let alone uh, this sort of like, you know, exceptional situation that we are living under right now uh, with all uh, the challenges that the pandemic is posing for policy and decision makers. So I do understand that those are the way forward, so to speak, but I just wanted to highlight that these are not easy, like solutions for uh, long-standing uh, an issue like uh, the pandemic that uh, is expecting to last for 
uh, the, at least the near future. So thank you very much. Well, excellent question, difficult to answer, uh, like good, any good question. Um, well, first of all, you can make the argument, I would make the argument that the pandemic is in some ways not a wicked problem. It's a simple problem. Once we find a way to beat the, to kill off this virus or a good vaccination system to prevent it, problem solved. It's not, an, it's not like climate change, for example, which is a truly wicked problem, where you do have, in fact, multiple interactions, uncertainties, uh, tipping points, and perhaps most importantly, both for the pandemic and for, thing, for climate change, there's no central government authority. That is, it's a world problem, but we deal with it in our own individual states, our own individual countries. Now, all that having been said, to deal with truly wicked problems, first of all, I think we need adequate information. And we've gotten, we have pretty good indicators about the pandemic, but perhaps not as good indicators as we would like. We need good information. And we need then not only good information, but we need to make sure that that information gets to the right places at the right times. So one of the, I think, you know, one of the major things we need to improve in government is its capacity to respond to changes in the real world in real time. Not to form a committee to study it, but for something like the pandemic to be able to respond relatively quickly. There's a word that's, or a phrase that's used in the business literature of strategic agility. That is, it combines two parts, I think, of dealing with these issues. Strategy, i.e. goal setting, having a general idea of how to get to where you want to be, but also agility, the capacity to respond quickly, to, to respond swiftly. Building that into governments is harder than perhaps it is into the private sector. But we need to think about the ways to do this, to, to deal with those wicked problems. Thank you so much, uh, Gay Peter. Uh, this is Hamid Ali. I'm, first, I thank you very much for allowing us to publish a book on your international series for public policy. Uh, given that we are pushing the arguments about the institutional reform and governance in the global south, and I'm so pleased that you are focusing now on the global, uh, from Pittsburgh out to the global uh, global perspective. And I'm also inviting you that is hopefully you will provide an opportunity for our colleagues to have a special issue on these issues of COVID and its impact on the global south. Uh, given that for the, in terms of the decision making, uh, we are always debating whether the democratic versus non-democratic government, which one is more effective in handling the crisis. Uh, so far, from the, our experience, seem to be even the non-democratic societies are advancing in handling and tackling this, uh, this COVID. Uh, is that going to be opening up a new frontier that is undo the democratic transitions and undo the it becomes some, some sort of, 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 of regressing back to the authoritarianism and some sort of, uh, of uh, instead of the citizen center government, it's going to be government-centered policy that is going to be subverting the way that we are making decisions and governs. Yeah, hi, good to see you, Professor Ali. Um, yeah, I, I think that is a very real danger, I think. Uh, we perhaps again, in terms of the lessons learned, the one lesson we may have learned too well is that you need a strong state to be able to handle some of these issues, or, or unless you have a very strong society to, to deal with it more socially. So I think you know, there is a real danger then that the dealing with the pandemic and the associated economic crises will tend to heighten the move that's already there to for, toward democratic backsliding, toward reducing the level of, of democratic governance around the world. 
But we've seen in a number of countries, some in Europe, some in other places. Uh, and I think it's a very, again, I think you've identified a very real challenge to me. How do, how do we govern real problems, real wicked problems, perhaps, in a truly democratic fashion? There is nobody has a question. I have one more question for you. Do you think the Gulf state they can diversify successfully as long as they are abundant in natural resources, or do we have to wait until we run out of oil, or until the oil, uh, you know, get out of uh, fashion or out of demand? I think the wise move is to diversify as soon as one can, uh, while there's still plenty of, of oil to, to support the diversification. Or the other option, of course, is to do like the, the Nor Norwegians have done, is to build the, uh, a, a fund, a massive fund, uh, based upon their oil wealth, that then they've used to deal with, with the society once the oil and gas runs out. So if you can save enough money while the gas and oil are there to deal with the transition later, fine. But I think clearly the wisest move is to think about the transition and begin it while the, while the, the money and the oil are still flowing. All right, I think our session coming to an end. I'd like to thank you very much, Dr. Peter, for this very informative and insightful uh, uh, presentation. And I'd like to thank all of you. Shukran lakum jamian. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.